Okay, so my name is Scott Crane. I'm the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Trout Lake, Washington. It is 90 miles from Portland and the furthest northeast corner of our Presbytery. I am doing a doctorate of ministry program in leadership and spirit, and one of my assignments for this semester is to do a field research thing, where I find out stuff related to the problem of my dissertation. The problem of my dissertation is stated as of right now, or continuing changes over the course of the year. This, the PC USA, specifically the Presbyterian Cascades, has not been adequately or effectively reaching the X, Y, Z generations. Wow. So, here is your opportunity to tell me your opinions on that. We're going to start right at the top. And it says, let's not make this go away, that in your opinion, why have some of our first periods churches lost membership steadily over the past 10 years? And of course, with the lens of what I just mentioned is my problem topic in place. You can answer whatever you want, but I'm going to use my lens for that. Why do you think that our first period churches have lost membership steadily over the last 10 years or so? Or do you think I'm wrong in stating that? Yes. Go right ahead. Five years. In fact, you are right. The, uh, the first uh, answer to that is that the number of people that we lose through death far exceeds the number of people that we bring in as new members. So the net trend has been down year over year. Uh, now, and then you can start asking why on that. Uh, new members, and I don't have exact numbers here, but new members have tended to more be uh, transfers, older people who are already church rather than younger people. Um, so end result is that the aging out has far exceeded the bringing in of the younger generation. We also lose people out uh, due to uh, life changes when they when people go empty nest. If the parents have had their children very involved in youth programs, a year or two later, they're in some cases the parents have drifted. So that's a couple starters. Thank you, Carol. What church are you at, and where are you located? I'm sorry. Which church are you at, and where are you located? Valley uh, Community Presbyterian Church here. In Any other thoughts about that? Yes, yeah, Gail, where are you from? I'm, I'm from London. Okay. I would suggest that um, people come but don't necessarily want to become members. That, that whole definition of what does membership mean, and if it really means committing to membership, I think there's a gap there that people aren't interested in being. They're, they ought to be involved in the program. Is that uh, something that you think is generation specific, or is that something that you just think overall? Okay. My, my current research would suggest that that's generational. And the XYZ generation, which is me and younger, don't like to join or commit, organized or institutionalized anything. But this thing is not about that, but that's true. <laughs> so that would be just one thing to keep out there. Other thoughts about why perhaps our Presbyterian churches have been declining over the last several years? Tom and then those two back there. At one time, we had a large Sunday school population who we were we did well in school and went off to college, and uh, I'm in Green Sports, so we're on the coast. And there aren't that many jobs for college graduates, so they went somewhere else and married their families, which would be going to our church or going to some other church. Also, we see very few youth, and it seems to me, just observing, that uh, these young people no longer need God, they have a smartphone. <laughs> I've answered your questions, and then in touch with their friends, and then meets their needs. What 
generation do you think uh, you would classify yourself as with that perspective? Uh, you turned out that way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Stanley, uh, Howard, Howie, and uh, Strauss and Howie, the two big guys who did generational theory a while back, have several successive books out, and there are uh, four specific generations gauged roughly by 20 years apart. And the ones that we have currently in uh, church are um, the silent generation, which would be the ones that came after the GI generation. And then we have the boomer generation, which is just ending their tenure as the leadership folks of the 42 to 65 year old block. And then after that comes my generation, which is generation X generation. And that's roughly 1960 to 83, or I don't know what it is, some 20 year old gap in there. But uh, the newest research is indicating that those 20 year gaps are also shrinking. So they're not 20 year generational differences anymore, they're other. So the generation Y is the millennial generation. They are entering their workforce um, with their uh, schooling behind them mostly. And then there's the, the uh, generation Z, which is the newest Barnaby study that just came out in January. Those are 18 year olds and younger. Um, and so that's the Z generation. Yes? Yes. You know, I, I I found it I couldn't worship that way, and um, I think that that we we've got to look at particularly these younger generations as to um, how do they learn, how do they best, and we've got more and more in education and collaborative learning and those sorts of things where it used to be sit in your seat and I'll tell you what you need to know, and I, I don't think we as a church have made that transition. Uh, right there. I can't read the name of it. I can't read the whole person. Can you go? Um, I've been that like a few years. My husband was the last year of the baby boomers, and I'm right before Gen X, so it was a little weird spot. But um, I've done that. <laughs> but um, I have two kids in the Y generation. I work from the church, and for me, it's always been like a big the traditional aspects of what their past was great. My kids grew up in Miami, been there over 20 years, so they're extended family because our family was all out of state or out of town. But what I know is from my kids, and the, the society is changing. Like, my kids, they just finished college. They can't buy a house in their early 20s, like, I was able to. And, uh, you speak with it. A little bit? Sure. Um, there, there's changes in society in regards to like you can't necessarily buy houses right out of college. They have debt. There's different things that are hitting them. And my kids are like, and they're really into the environment and stuff and gender fluidity. You know that that should not. It should be a non-thing anymore. So I think there's a lot of that transition happening where the values and things are different. They they want to travel now. <laughs> but you know, there, there's all of these changes that are not just monetary, but societal aspects, and somewhat of an enlightenment of like gender and, and all these different issues that weren't uh, talked about so much that are now it's like we're always talking about. Them. Right. So I think there's a lot of that happening, and they don't. The the building church isn't a necess It's not necessary. Believe in God to go to a church. Right. I think, you know, the. See, back in the 70s, we heard about you can't go to the church because the church is in you. Yeah. But now we've got to go to. You can't go to church because. Is there a God? Yeah, and they, they have access to information and, and they, they like the community of church, but they don't feel it's necessary to go. Mm -hmm. So I've got one kid that's still like, we'll come to church with us until the other one. Is not as excited, he'll go, but um, I think there's just a lot of society changes. Yeah. Uh, correct. Um, one of the last books before uh, Strauss passed away by Howard Strauss was Fourth Turnings, or uh, The Fourth Turning, I think is the correct title. That book was a bestseller. 
and it basically talks about the four generations flip one, two, three, four, and then go back one, two, three, four again over hundreds and hundreds of years, if not more than that. And our current location in society is at the fourth turning. So what happens during that fourth turning is there's an unraveling of everything that's gone before, testing of all everything, and then the new first gen people come in, which are usually characterized as the civic or the builders or those that set up what's going to be happening for the next cycle of four. That's the millennials, by the way. So they're the ones coming in to this place that has all these structures and institutions and stuff set up from the previous four, and they're like, is this what we want? No. So now they're going to set up whatever it is, and those of us who are going to be around to watch it happen are going to be very excited, because in another generation and a half, like once the 18-year-old and youngers are up and beginning to head to their leadership years of 42 to 65, our society is going to look vastly different. And it might be really, really cool. And it might be really, really good for the church. But in order to get there, those of us that are in the church now have to be able to address the needs or the interests or where this particular turning point is. And that's basically what my research is about and what I'm going to write about when I get to the next year of this stuff. But, uh, so, um, you can all catch my book later, right? <laughs> Any other thoughts? There's one over, you want to say something, Tom, and then you right there after that? Now, in your town, um, there's a church that has a youth group that began to be successful in attracting youth. The kids go where the other kids go. It's like the favorite ball shop or the favorite place to buy clothing. Anyway, they all go to this church, and then so and a lot of the parents go there, so they wind up with all these different generations. We are down to 30 people uh, there on the three services. The kids made a difference. The minister does a great job, but it's like all of the kids and nothing's going to look like. I don't know if this is other places, but in a small town, it certainly has that. Yeah. Effect. Thanks for pointing it out. Yeah, so that was a silent generation for Greek <laughs> Silent generation for Greek Sports. It's had something to say. Basically, that the church in his town that's not his church it has a really good youth program that's attractive youth. So let me step outside and think academically for a minute. That's an attraction model of church, which will not work anymore in the new turning. There's something else that's going to have to work besides attraction model. So eventually that particular big church that now has all the youth and the families is going to do the same thing that ours has been doing, which is, now I'm going to put myself again, I have 22 people, 23 people in my church in Trout Lake and the little Baptist church down the road is the other one in our valley that's Christian and there are other expressions of faith in our valley that are not. And um, if they go to church in Trout Lake, it's the Baptist one, the kids and the families, usually. If they decide they don't like that particular Baptist preaching, then they go down to the river or somewhere else and find another church that has similar likes to them. And that's kind of where they're, where they're going. And there was, you had a comment. Um, I think one of the things that um, we've experienced it. It took us a long time to discuss the issue of same-sex marriage. Way too long. And the kids that are out there are going, why did it take them so long to talk about this? It took us, I mean, we, we wanted to be diligent about it. We wanted to hear everybody. We probably took a couple of years at least to really figure out where we stood. And we lost the confidence, the, the focus of a lot of people because we just took too long. Uh, I worked at West Park University before I retired, and I had a lot of students who just kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? Taking that much time to something like that? What do you think about that one? You don't think it's not an issue. It's a non issue. Um, the other thing I want to mention is um, you talk about people who are at their iPhones and their phones, devices. Um, uh, if you were at General Assembly in this here in Portland, you heard the Litter Street Worship Band, which was part of the, I think it was the opening of the worship for one of the services. That was ours. And they are our second service um, music. And they are Where are you, Jen? And they are dynamic. They, the director of that group also directs the chancel choir, which is, I, I say they, there's too much Latin. He can do everything, but, the, the Winter Street Worship Band is 
is electronic. And people come for that kind of music. Um, yet they get the same sermon as we get in the first service or more or less. Um, so can you take a look at that service and, and generationally tell me who you think is filling it? Uh, let me just say there's a handful, and I literally mean, well, maybe two handfuls, of uh, baby boomers and up, and the rest are down from there. And we have a very large um, youth contingent because they come to worship and then they take off after that for their own class. But um, Thank you. Yeah. But, they, but they don't join the church. For all of us who have or wish to have younger generations, this is one thing that the iPhones and iPads and touch and do dad and dads, the mothers, whatever they are, screens have taught us about the millennials and younger. Millennials and younger are native to the digital age. I'm not. I'm one of you. <laughs> I'm right back in between the X and the boomer group, probably for more X. <laughs> uh, and um, so we've had to learn that stuff and sometimes love it and sometimes hate it, basically. But those that are in the millennial and younger are natives. And so what that means for them is instantly, instantly, they've got performance level stuff coming out of their phone. Now, if you've got a budget big enough to do it, if you can have a performance level music service, they'll be there. Because that's even better than a phone that's live. But if you don't, like my church and probably 95% of our churches in our presbytery, then what do you do? And that's a big question that I'm struggling with. Yes? Question. Question later. So, is there value in being really upfront about what you believe? questions here as we're thinking. I have a few other things that I'd like to have us just sort of do. We've touched a little bit on the worship style question and whether or not we have not touched on actually whether there have been times in the history of your particular church where this worship style has shifted or not. In mine, we've had some experiments, but overall it stays traditional. Uh, if you had a service uh, like let's see, when I was growing up in Westminster Salem, we had a traditional service, and we added one, and then we added blend, and now I think they're all blend. I don't know. I haven't been there for a while, but um, so a blend means you've got some normal stuff that's traditional, and then a lot of stuff that's electronic. I don't know what they do now because I haven't. Like I have my own church, I'm working this. So I don't know what they do now, there, but um, that's that's one thing. If you've had uh, different worship styles. We are currently in an age and a time when adaptive leadership is needed. So Todd uh, Bolsinger, current uh, associate dean or something rather of Fuller, um, who was a Presbyterian pastor before for 14 years at Sam or something rather Presbyterian church down in that area. Um, he wrote a book called Communing the Mountains. And basically it's a book about wanting all of us in the church mainline Protestants to think about adaptive leadership and what that means. It's not a technical fix because a technical fix is rearranging the desk chairs. We already have all the answers here they all are. We've done it for 40 years. No, that's a technical fix. We are no longer in a technical fix era. We are in an adaptive fix era, which means we've got to come up with something different with the people that we're working with to figure out what moves them. And that's the basic premise. If we can be adaptive and we can make some changes towards the bigger institutional issues. And, and we're not alone. Every institution in this country is dealing with it. They're just going back to your local shopping mall and seeing how they're figuring out how to keep the mall open in an age of Amazon. Right. So, or ask yourself if you work for Eastman Kodak and 
build business goes bizarre on you. If you don't adapt, you're gone. Uh, so we're not the only ones facing this issue. And it is a, it's a societal issue. It's, it goes to the very core of our society. I was Todd was saying, not Ted. I got the first name off. Todd Tiffany. I worked on a book, Canoeing the Mountains. Canoeing the Mountains. Yes. He uses as his uh, advance organizer the trip of Lewis and Clark Corps Discovery. And basically says when they got to the headwaters of the first river with their canoes, there was no Columbia on the other side of the mountains. There were a whole lot of other mountains. So at that point, they became an adaptive leadership corps and they had to change their way of doing things. Got rid of the canoes, got a bunch of horses, and started further the, the exploration that they were asked to do. Yes? So Scott, uh, Christine Cole, the Presbyterian Church. Um, that really, I mean, I'm kind of just trying what I'm hearing in the congregation or in this group. And that's, um, so it Oak Hills, where is it? Uh, it's in the Grove area, the Milwaukee market. Um, we've, we've had an interesting experience with diversity of worldview and backgrounds of people coming into the church. So I would say we've we've succeeded. I, you know, we're growing steadily. I mean, a little bit. Uh, we're not declining. Uh, and we haven't been really outspoken about that. We believe this one thing. Um, if anything, we've just kind of said um, we're following Christ and and what we've done is we've had discussions about things like human sexuality, where we really tried to be very open to all voices and gentle and kind and patient when there was disagreement. So we had these conversations, and we agreed to disagree. And we have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have you know Baptists, we have big box church people. We're kind of all mashed up together. And that's been, in my experience, it's been a good thing for us. I don't know where that fits in any of the, the membership theories. I can tell you exactly where that fits. Oh, okay. So you are an anomaly, and you're the right anomaly. What's happening in across the board, uh, mainline Protestant, historically white churches is the steep decline. Those churches that have adopted and welcomed and done things inter intentionally multicultural and interracial are growing. The overall majority voice of Christianity is no longer WASP, so to speak. Well, I would say we're still pretty white, um, but the, the diversity is of our uh, worldview, um, but not necessarily diverse. I'd love to see your diversity. <laughs> <laughs> so we all, and that's the way that the church will survive because of the diversity and multi-racial, multi-ethnic groups joining together in one community of faith. Did anything in your study suggest um, like a, it'd be positive to have like a, a community where you have a bunch of people with different worldview differences rather than racial? I just started that one. <laughs> so oh. I just started that book. I don't have it done yet, and I don't have the title because it was one of those online e-book things, and it's by an Asian American author who's slamming the white, historical white Protestant church. So I've had to put my arm around to read it, but it's been very, very good. He is true, truly claiming that the multiracial, multi-ethnic churches are growing, and then we just have to get over the Western white civilization Eurocentric model that we've had for the last however long it's been. And that's very telling. Because if you look at our presbytery, we're pretty centered in that. So. I see more hands. We'll go there and there and there. I was going to respond to what she said because we're the one union church in our presbytery. Um, and with that. As in Methodist Presbyterian. Yes. Yeah. Methodist. But a lot of other churches are not and the reason I want to say something is because it's very similar to what you're talking about is some of these great uh, variations in the world views of something. But it's also, and like people have said, but we also have a hard time in saying the 
what we believe in in terms of sharing that with others is not as simple. <laughs> Correct, it is not simple. To, 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 to have others come into that and say, yeah, you know, we agree to disagree on things, and, but, we, but we're also very willing to have conversations. So this is a side note, and my research isn't going this direction, but it's good to know. Um, the push towards radical hospitality that we read about from literature in um, Methodist tradition, specifically their canon retreat uh, tradition, um, also the Benedictine tradition, all of those could be adopted by us if we can get over the fears that we have in some that the threat has been detected. Right? Radical hospitality. And that if we train ourselves that way and open our hearts and, and let the fear go away, that would be, I might pause it towards the end of my dissertation, but I don't know yet, one of the solutions. So another, right there, yeah. I'm Chuck. I'm Chuck, and I'm a retired minister, and I'd like to throw a little history in it since I'm an old guy. Clerk of Presbyterian a long time ago, for a long time. Yeah. And about the time that I was uh, being ordained, which was uh, in 1962, our church was going through a whole long period of deciding that maybe women were okay to be ministers. And we'd gone through a whole long period before that saying, oh, well, maybe women could be elders. And so there is a, a tradition within our tradition that we take a long time to wrestle with these things before we make some decisions. True. Where has the power base, which I'm just a little bit shocked because I know you, where was the power base centered during those times of incremental growth? I'm not, I don't know that I know the answer, but I thought maybe you could make your research go back to see where they've been parallels. There is, and that's in the fourth turning theory, generational theory. That particular power base was over 90% male white. Okay. My final comment is that I have a little 8.5 by 11, it should be 8.5 by 14. You see a paper at home that shows the uh, way that the Presbyterian Church has divided and reunited. And it's a very interesting scale of things. And we, it's, again, we just keep doing it. And you know, we're going through churches are leaving our denomination to go to other Presbyterian denominations now. We've gone through variations of that in the past. And there'll be an issue and something will happen and then, oh, finally we say, well, I don't know, maybe we ought to get together. What I like about our denomination and why I'm still in it is that we do totally and completely and utterly piece everything that we can together to come up with something and make that incremental step forward. What I'm afraid of is the fact that the millennials aren't going to wait for us. And neither will Generation Z. They're like, they're already, and we're passe or something. I don't know what we are. But, so that's a fear that I have going forward as we continue to do what we've always been able to do, which is progressive, just maybe not at a job. <laughs> Back there, you have a comment? You can't read your name or where you're from? Uh, white, I'm from uh, Pioneer Church in Morgan. Thank you. Uh, and appearances aside, I actually come from the African American Presbyterian tradition. I'm married to uh, African American slash Native American who's a Roman Catholic. And I find myself in a church now that uh, where multiculturalism means Fins, sweets, and no <laughs> So, uh, and we have the same problem with a lot of churches. It's become a, we lost a lot of numbers, mid 20s now, in a worshiping congregation, and all older. And I have second thoughts about it. I'm not quite sure what adaptive leadership is. But I think if you adapt too much, you lose your core values. What I've attempted to do is to bring people into the church for tangentially religious or non-religious reasons. So we have classes in everything from 
yoga to meditation to art. Uh, we sponsor concerts of secular music. And as for the service itself, I've, I've attempted to make it more consciously symbolic, more colorful, uh, and simply to preach the creed. I don't get into politics. Uh, if we want to have a separate discussion about something, we'll do that. But I feel that we offer something that the world needs, and I don't want to obscure that message. And so the idea is just to get people in on whatever basis so they walk through the door. And once they're there, maybe they discover something that they need. Thank you very much. That's great, Craig. I, I was tempted to put in an espresso machine and get a barista. <laughs> I thought we were going to bring people in, and if it didn't, it still, we still have great coffee. <laughs> I haven't been able to convince you that. The uh, community uh, co op of the Lutheran Methodist churches in the Pinto does that, right in the back of the center. Just as a. <laughs> So I'm going to look at a couple more things on my screen real quick. Uh, I don't know what our time is. We have about 10 more minutes till 4 o'clock. And so I'm going to wrap this up without getting through everything I wanted to get through. And I'm sure lots of you have more things you want to say. I would doubly encourage you to speak to one another, problem solve, be creative, speak to some of those other generations you don't normally speak to, and find out some things that make people tick outside of your regular, oh, I know Joe, I'll talk to Joe. Why don't you, why don't you go talk to Joe's kid? And, and or whatever it might be, so that you have a sense of what's going on out there. Okay. Really quickly, some of these we've already answered. Uh, in our opinions, yes, cultural changes have affected the ability to be involved. I agree. There was a comment back there about that. Uh, the church's level of meaningful engagement with the community. One of those things that you just mentioned is doing things just to bring the people in the door, or whether it's secular concerts or some other classes. That's something we can do. It's practicing radical hospitality, and some other uh, things we've mentioned. Here's one of the questions that I have not yet touched on that I would like to touch on because it directly affects me. So, how many of you have program type things or some sort of offering, whether it be Sunday or other days of the week, that help young families? As in, I have three little kids. Yay, Audrey. They come to this church, by the way. <laughs> and they're not me. Others? Yay, that's in the back. A million homeschool things. Awesome. Okay. So those of you that have those types of things in your churches, three out of how many in the sanctuary? Hmm. You can probably teach us a lot of stuff about what they need in order to show up. I can tell you what I need in order to show up. If I'm going to do something that enriches myself, I need child care. If I'm going to do something that enriches my kids, I may want to be with them to do it because I'm a helicopter parent. Or I need to know the people who are going to be doing things with them so that I can do something else. Now, am I of that generation that's going to drop the kids off and go have a latte down the street? No, I'm not the generation that's going to bring a latte with me to the sanctuary, even if you have put a sign posted that says no drinking food in the sanctuary, because I'm an ex, all right? <laughs> so there's some of those things to think about as you're facing some of this. I'd like to offer a prayer for all of us. That's the end of what I have to work on right now. Um, I'd be happy to do updates as I get further in my doctorate of ministry program on leadership and spirit. I may want to come back and have you guys talk to me some more. All right? Let's pray together. Almighty God, you have gifted us with all the generations that are currently living and all the stories of those who are no longer with us. Use those stories. Use these generations and these turnings of generations to teach us something about you that we might draw closer to the great spirit that you are, that you might draw out of us the spirit that you have embedded in us, that we might reach those who need to be reached in whatever they need to have, so that they too might come to know you. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity to be together today and to begin wrestling with these things. Be with us as we go from this place and the rest of our meeting, and especially back where we do ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Thank you all for participating.